I'm very excited that I have two very respected legal minds, professors of constitutional law joining me for today's discussion to talk about pretty much the most important consequential issues of our time. So it couldn't be any more important, one might argue. And you know Eric Siegel because he joins me regularly. He's a constitutional law professor. He's an author. He is the Kathy and Lawrence Ash Professor of Law at Georgia State University. And also joining us today is Michael Dorf. He is the Robert S. Stevens Professor of Law at Cornell Law School. And uh, if only your namesakes uh, for your chairs could know that you're both joining me, Pete Dominic, I can't imagine they would be more proud, gentlemen. <laughs> Mike's Thank you very alive. much. Mike, is yours alive? Uh, no, he's a, a former dean of Cornell Law School. Okay. <laughs> uh, but his, uh, his family is still alive. So. Okay. Well, either way, what an honor for them to have you join me uh, in this very important conversation. Gentlemen, I appreciate uh, you both joining me today, and uh, I hope everybody will check out dorfonlaw.org, which is the blog that Michael created. How would you describe what folks will find there and why you started this? Uh, so it's a mix of legal commentary, some economics, a lot of politics, and then occasionally something else that strikes my fancy or Eric's or that of Neil Buchanan or Diane Klein or Sherry Culp or any of the other people who blog for me regularly. Uh, the reason I started it is actually sort of funny, which is I signed up for some um, web hosting to post my CV online when I was frustrated that the law school I was currently affiliated with at the time was doing a bad job. And I had all this extra space. So I thought, well, I'll just put a blog up there. Uh, <laughs> and that was, uh, that was 14 years ago. <laughs> Oh, that explains my career as well. Uh, I had five minutes of comedy, but I, I was given 15, so I had to fill it. Uh, all hey, right. Pete, 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 before we yeah. start, you know me and my technical limitations. Uh -oh. are, pe are people seeing my name as Daisy Alex when, you, when this gets posted? Um, I think they probably will. Can you explain that then, please? No one can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so when we started the Zoom, as most people realize now using Zoom, I started it. I am the host, and I invited these gentlemen to join me. And first was Daisy Alex. <laughs> Daisy Alex wants to join the Zoom. And I'm like, no, motherfucker, you can't join my, I don't know who you are. I don't, you're not invited. I only invited Eric Siegel and Michael Dorf to this important discussion. And so I was like, well, they, it, it's gotta be one of them. Maybe they're using somebody else's computer. So I clicked on and admitted Daisy Alex and up comes Siegel and he, Reports have no, no relationship or, or familiarity with any person with those two letter, words in, the, in their name. But, I so think I Mike put it there to throw me off, Pete. That's yeah. what I oh, yeah. He's that Somehow kind of guy. He... <laughs> Mike, the only thing Mike put in to throw us off is his backdrop. So let's just <laughs> ignore it. He's at, he's at a library where people are not practicing social distancing. So that, that should probably help you understand where he's starting. Um, okay. So... Guys, we're talking about abortion today and uh, the, a really important Supreme Court case that is about to be decided. And Eric, you wrote uh, at Dorf on Law a, a piece called The Pro-Choice Progressive Argument for the Court Overturning Roe and Casey, these two Supreme Court cases that deal with the issue. And then, Michael, you responded with a piece at the blog at dorfonlaw.org titled, What's wrong with Professor Siegel's win by losing approach to abortion? And I just before we even get to this, two things I want to explain. Number one, I love that there's a place, in this case, Dorf on Law, the blog, where people can have a vigorous debate. I mean, Michael, you really call Eric out uh, on a number of his arguments, and it's great, and you back him up. It's not personal. It's really thoughtful. It's, it's, it's well argued. It seems that that is a province of the, the nature of the work that, that you guys are in, academics, constitutional law professors, lawyers even. But the, most of America can't even have a thoughtful argument. Michael, first of all, a word about you know, the blog and how you're able to host and post someone's you know, opinion here that you really don't agree with. Right. Well, so first of all, it helps to be obscure. Uh, so that, you know, uh, when I do get discovered occasionally by the mass audience, there are, you know, more vitriolic uh, sort of web typical responses. But, you know, I, I you know, look, uh, 
it's in the nature of being a scholar to take ideas seriously, to realize that uh, you can disagree with somebody and still respect that person's intellect. Um, I've been very lucky that the people who comment on my blog, I'm just talking about readers now, uh, for the most part, not entirely, but you know, they will comment on the merits. They will some, they'll disagree strongly. And even when um, occasionally you get um, a sort of trollish comment, what I try to do is either ignore it or respond as though it is intended in good faith. And I found that, <laughs> you know, over the years that, that uh, even if it's not originally intended in good faith, if you respond that way, people tend to uh, respond on the merits. So I, you know, the other thing is that although Eric and I are disagreeing about, you know, a, a prediction here, yeah. it's not a fundamental clash of values. We say we both basically have the same normative goals and so in that sense it's you know it's not that hard for us to disagree right, that's, that's true yeah, yeah. On, on that point pete um mike and i both want safe secure um safe abortions for women you know you know inexpensive safe abortions for women all over the country so we we agree on the baseline thing we think we have we disagree about how the best way to get there is given how bad a hand we've been dealt Okay, well, right. exactly. And given um, the, so, so now the next thing is obviously saying that we are three men talking about women's reproductive rights. And I'll say, it's my show. I invited the two of you on because you know each other uh, well, have a familiarity with each other and have a lot of scholarship on the issue. And it was easy to book. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm just saying, I mean, I would have loved to have Dahlia Lithwick here or, or any number, or somebody else, uh, you know, women who might not even agree, uh, but I don't. So we can put that on me, and I don't think that you guys conceding to do debate says much about you as it does me. But if you want to add anything to the fact that I've got the two of you, or that maybe the two of you are arguing about this issue on the blog, and yet neither of you are females. Is there anything to say about that, Michael? Uh, so I do have a book on abortion that is co-authored with an actual genuine woman. Um, <laughs> so uh, who happens to be Mike's wife, by the way, oh. right. and also my colleague. So yeah. that's uh, uh, and so of course I'll plug the book. It's called Beating Hearts: Abortion and Animal Rights, um, published by Columbia University Press. And so you know, I, but yeah, I mean, I'm I'm who I am. I have views. They're a product of my experiences and i'd like to think of uh having listened to a lot of people with different experiences and you can get that book in the show notes for today's podcast it's linked in there uh eric what would you add to that uh you're a man well, I, I i think in a perfect world we'd have both a anti-choice person talking right and 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 maybe a woman but on the other hand what generated this podcast i think was my blog that even though mike disagreed with he was you know, um, he, he agreed to publish. Um, and really, it's a controversial issue that I don't think the female perspective is necessary to discuss, because we're really talking about politics in a way that is gender neutral, I think, in some way, in the sense of how, uh, of how it's going to spin out. Because yeah. what Mike and I fundamentally disagree about is what the Supreme Court should do with the case that's being decided this June. All right, so, and, so, so let me just ask you this then to start. Um, is this a legal analysis that we're about to go into, or is it a, more of a political analysis? Is it a little of both, Eric? I, well, I think Mike wrote an amicus brief in that case. So I'm going to defer to Mike to describe the case you know, fairly briefly. And, and he has his priors, but he's going to, I know Mike is going to describe it fairly. Then we're going to get into politics because, Pete, law is politics all the way down. Okay, so uh, Mike, explain what an amicus brief is for my audience and then what so, yours. Yeah, so amicus curiae is Latin for friend of the court. Uh, it, when the Supreme Court hears almost every case these days, in addition to briefs by the parties, they also accept briefs by interested outsiders, and it's fancifully called this amicus brief. Um, these can be trade groups, they can be nonprofits, they can be states that are not involved directly in the case. In this case, it's a, a brief by a bunch of law professors. And uh, our position in the case is that the court ought to 
um, uh, strike down the Louisiana law that's at stake in the, in the case. Now, if you want, I can go into explain what the law involves and try to do that as briefly as possible. Well, I do, and I want to get to that in a minute, but a little bit more background as well. I think it's important for listeners, uh, and if we post the video of this, viewers to know that you also clerked for Justice Kennedy, and that's important because he had a vote on these cases. And it's also important to mention that you clerked for Supreme Court Justice, whereas Eric Siegel did, did not clerk for a Supreme Court Justice. I think this is my friend. This is my friend talking. I think that's true. I'm, also, I'm also a lot taller than Eric. Is that right? Yes, yes, but I could box him out though, because I, 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 I could box Mike out. Right, settle down, Daisy it. Alex. So <laughs> any, um, yeah, but, so, all right, so let me start with this. Do you, do you both agree that the Supreme Court is eventually going to return the issue of abortion to the states. Michael, do you, do you, you agree with that? I forget which one of you wrote that sentence. Uh, so Eric thinks that. My view is that the future is fundamentally unknowable. Um, I am frequently asked by my students whether they should go work for one law firm or another. And I always tell them, this is a very consequential decision you're about to make. You have no idea how to decide because the things that are gonna make a difference are completely random. You know what person you meet on, uh, on some business trip. Uh, I think that the Supreme Court is, is that way because our political system is like that. It's chaotic, like the weather. I think if I were betting, I would bet on the Supreme Court at least paring back substantially on the abortion right. But I, I think there's that anybody who confidently predicts the outcome, given all the imponderables, including electoral ones, uh, is, you know, has a, a false sense of confidence. Let me Eric, you, to that. Eric yeah, you have a me... false sense of confidence because you're the one predicting that. No, I, I, I my prediction comes with humility. Um, I, I actually, Mike is not, my, my piece is really a rooting piece. This is what I want the court to do more than this is what the court is gonna do this term. If I had to bet on this Louisiana case, and real quickly, it doesn't matter, we've talked about it before, Pete. Doctors have to have admitting privileges within 30 miles of a hospital to, um, you know, to, 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 to be able to do an abortion. That's the case is that, we, that you guys are arguing about. That's the case before the court this term. Yeah. And the Supreme talking, Court yeah. invalidated this exact same law four years ago in Texas. Um, and so it was kind of a mystery why they granted strip to take the case. What's changed is Kavanaugh and Gorsuch have replaced, um, you know, Scalia and Kennedy. And what would you being, add? What would you add to that, Michael? His just setting up. Well, PR, I wasn't finished. Hold on. Oh, excuse me. I disagree with Michael about one. About, with Michael about one essential thing. Okay. Um, there are many Supreme Court cases that we don't know how they're going to come out, but there are many Supreme Court cases we can predict with a ninety-eight percent certainty how they are going to come out because we can count votes. So this is not one of them, by the way. That this abortion case is not one of them. But in general, um, you know, if you take abortion, affirmative action, and all that stuff for the last twenty years, the, the, the front page cases, we can predict with pretty good certainty at least what the vote's going to be. It's rare they surprise us in front page cases. Okay. Yeah. So let me just uh, qualify what I said before. To I, I think we're not fundamentally disagreeing. When I said the future is fundamentally unknowable, I didn't mean that it's unknowable in all cases how the current justices are going to vote on a particular case. What I meant was if an issue is not going to be decided for potentially for five or 10 years, we don't know who the personnel are going to be on the court. We don't know how they're going to vote. So that, that was the, the yeah, nature of my qualification. All right. So I think now we should probably move on to the case that you first made, Eric, uh, in your piece at Dorf on Law, Abortion, Judicial Review, and Plain a terrible hand. You set it up. You say we're in a bad situation for the future of women's reproductive rights, no matter what, because of who uh, is in charge. The president of the United States is Donald Trump. The Supreme Court is who is on the Supreme Court and the precedent for where they are and stand on the issue of abortion, especially the, the, the chief justice and the new, the two new additions. Uh, I should I, I argue all the, all of the, uh, quote, conservative justices. We, we, we kind of know where they are on the abortion. So you take it from there. So you're saying that this case, the Louisiana case, uh, you, you hope what? I, I hope, well, so Justice Roberts at the, the, the lower court decision upheld this law based on factual distinctions from the Texas case that Mike and I both agree are ridiculous and absurd and don't distinguish the two cases. And Justice Roberts asked a few questions along those lines, which I think people misinterpreted. I think people thought he was asking those questions to um, 
to see if there was a factual difference. I think he was asking those questions to show there isn't. And the only way to uphold this law is to reverse Roe and Casey. But let me get to my main point. In 2016, 21%, one in five voters said the Supreme Court was the biggest issue to them. Of that one in five, 56% voted for Donald Trump. Those are huge numbers when he won swing states by three swing states by less than a football stadium. So even a small change in how the election goes could make a big difference. I think abortion is the single most important issue to evangelicals. I think evangelicals are a huge part of Trump's support. And I think that if, we, if the court does not reverse Roe and Casey, which is what they'll probably, they're probably not gonna do that. And then Trump can make abortion an issue again. If the Supreme Court were to reverse Roe and Casey, it's going to be much harder for, the, for Trump to make abortion an issue by waving around lists of judges and talking about Justice Scalia. Now, if I thought Roe and Casey were secure for the next 10 years, I would say, no, I, I'm pro-choice and, and I'd rather have that. Unlike Mike, I am somewhere between 80 and 100 percent, 90 percent sure that Roe and Casey will not be with us within a few years. That being the case, playing poker, that's a prediction, but I'm 80% sure. All right, that we, being the case, I would rather them take the issue out of the election now than after the election. And one last thing, part of this is an emotional plea on my heart. I want to think that Justice Roberts, who has just been a horrific justice in my opinion, in many different ways, the author of Shelby County, the author of a terrible affirmative action decision, um, voted you know, with majority in Citizens United. I would like to think that he hates Trump as much as the three of us does, do. Because I think he might be a civil man, from what I've heard. I think he might be a, a guy who takes integrity seriously, maybe. And maybe, he, just maybe, he doesn't want Trump reelected. And if he doesn't want Trump reelected, and he's going to reverse Roe and Casey anyway, do it now. But there's so many assumptions, and it's purely political analysis here that, number one, that if you took the issue of abortion off the, off the chart, that the right-wing evangelical right would lose a lot of their enthusiasm. And I think some. All we need is some. Well, I think Michael makes a really good point in his piece with they'll replace it with plenty of other things, number one. And you're also making an assumption that – that Roberts uh, thinks, by the way, that your political analysis is right, that this would, this anim very animating issue of abortion, which is also so animating, would really make that much of a difference. Michael? So, yeah, you uh, anticipated some of my response, which is, you know, if you think about the modern Republican Party, right, it really dates to realignment in the 1960s following Nixon's so called Southern strategy, which mobilized the existing coalition primarily through issues of racial resentment. Uh, abortion comes later, and it comes with the sort of uh, rise of political activism among religious conservatives. Abortion is undoubtedly one of those issues, but it's not the only one. There's also prayer in schools. There's opposition to gay rights, including but not limited to same-sex marriage. Uh, in recent years, gun rights have become extremely important for this coalition. So there's a whole constellation of issues that people get mobilized around, some of which are about the Supreme Court. So when those, you know, 56% uh, of the 18% say they care about the Supreme Court, not all of that is abortion. Some of that is about gun rights, for example. Uh, and of course, we live in an era in which um, people's views and how uh, adamantly they pursue them does not just come from within, it's also manipulated and motivated by political actors, right? So people, politicians are very good at finding wedge issues and then using them. So I would also add that the court overturning Roe and Casey would not take abortion out of politics. It would just shift the frame. And I want to make two points about that. One is that uh, the conventional wisdom is that if the, uh, the right wins on abortion by getting Roe and Casey overturned, they'll say, great, done our job, let's go home. 
Uh, that's not generally the way politics works. Usually people who win are sort of excited and they often want to then pursue further, further goals. But second, there will be all sorts of subsidiary issues. For example, how do we now preserve our advantage in the court? And so we want to continue to elect uh, presidents who are sympathetic to us. Uh, can we get people in Congress who are going to support our legislation? What about the president who's going to sign that legislation? So I think it's, I, I think it's again, right, going back to my original framing, uh, politics is like the weather. Uh, you take one piece out, it doesn't mean that everything else stays the same. Yeah, let me respond to that, Pete, because I, 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 re I, I really um, want to say a few personal things about it, actually. Um, so unlike the two of you, I have lived in the South for 30 years, 40, 40 years, 40 years. Um, while growing up in New York. Um, I, I want to tell a story that I'm not, I'm not using it for empirical proof, but I do think it reflects what I'm talking about and, and, and is in fact indicative of this whole conversation. When I got married to Lynn, my wife, um, we said no presents, except uh, no presents, but if you want to do something, donate to a homeless shelter or to Planned Parenthood, because we met when I gave a talk at Planned Parenthood. And my wife has cousins she's very close to, who are evangelicals, I, I'm sorry, was close to it growing up. They're evangelicals in Michigan. And because we made Planned Parenthood a voluntary, you know, gift, gift they boycotted all way. And- well, that's, had, what, that's the reason they gave, you know. No, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> it was the real reason. I wish and, everybody would give a, a choice of a f offensive <laughs> nonprofits. <laughs> it, no, but that's my point though. Yeah. See, I, I, they would not avoid, they care about guns, some. They care about gay rights, some. What is your point in, in, in remarking about this one my, my, my this point family is that, people, that I'm, I'm going to make a very obnoxious point. So Revis, Revis Siegel and Linda, no relation, and Linda Greenhouse are two eminent, uh, one law professor, one former New York Times Supreme Court reporter, who have written a lot about Roe and Casey from a feminist perspective and backlash. They're, they're wrong on every level. And I think Mike is really wrong here when he underestimates the double whammy of abortion combined with the Supreme Court putting it down their throats. See, that's, that's where I think the conventional wisdom among law professors is really wrong, although some people do agree with me on this. Mike is right. Abortion politics will move to the legislature, obviously, if, if Roe and Casey is overturned. Another good point, yeah. But listen, the New York Times headline. Supreme Court overturns Roe, deflates, deflates so much of the evangelical right. And more importantly than that, I have personally, again, I'm not using this for data, but on Facebook, so many people, we held our nose to vote for Trump because of abortion. And I have no doubt there are, not, not the leaders, but there are evangelicals out there who voted for Trump ugh, because of abortion. If I thought Roe and Casey were going to stick around, then I would say, eh. But that, so we're really disagreeing. I, I think Mike said, by the way, Mike said in his response to me, if I am right that Roe and Casey are not going to be around, and if I am right that taking them away would affect the election, he might jump aboard my train. So... My argument isn't that far-fetched. Mike is just disagreeing well, with the factual I, predicates. The one point that I have to make that neither of you made, and Michael got closest, and I feel really smart even submitting this to a conversation <laughs> between you two nerds, is, you know, Michael just said, politicians are good at finding other wedge issues. And, and neither of you wrote about or has mentioned yet, and maybe this is just bullshit, that Donald Trump doesn't need, this is different, Trump politics. This isn't examining traditional politics or what a lot of people refer to as conventional wisdom. He doesn't need traditional wedge issues that animate people. They're important. He gets on them. What, wait, hold, Pete, hold on. I'll tell you Why what. did he take a list? He was the first candidate in history, I think, yeah. to have a list of Supreme Court nominees. Yeah, brilliant. He literally, he literally enlisted yeah. the Federalist Society. Yeah, no, to it do doesn't it. mean it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It doesn't doesn't mean that that isn't true. What I'm, what I'm saying is if he didn't have abortion, if he didn't have guns, remember what he did before the 2018 election. We can argue that it didn't work. You probably will. All he talked about was a caravan. He doesn't need your traditional issues. He tells people to drink chlorine and they do. He, and they do. I mean, it's not, 
he tells people not to get vaccinated and they won't. So he doesn't need these issues, Michael. Yeah, so I want to totally agree with that. Brilliant of you to think of that before either <laughs> He's of us. He's Koreshian. Yeah. Oh my so God, Michael's the, totally kissing no, I, I, I agree. So, so, so um, it, is, it is now a conventional trope in political science, and I think it is true, that our politics are tribal. And what is meant by that is that attachments come first, issues come second. So, um, you know, the you say, well, these people, what they care, what they really care about is abortion. They do. They care about abortion. They care about a lot of things, but they care most about is a kind of identity. And you, and so look at the, the move um, on the Republican Party on free trade, right? So pre-Trump, uh, both parties are sort of free trade, but the Republican Party especially. Trump is against free trade, and so that's the dominant view on the right. And you can find, by the way, you can find similar things on the, the left as well. And where, by the way, in both sides, because I've talked about that issue a lot, have no idea the first thing about trade. No idea. I want to say that I agree with everything you bo both of you guys have said and what Mike was just about to say, but I interrupted him. I agree with every single thing about that. But, so none, of me, that, but, but none of that is germane. None of it. To my point, that uh, 78,000 people, I think, in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and, uh, and Wisconsin or Ohio, I forget which, 78,000 people separated Trump from Hillary Clinton. And the single most important, I agree with Mike about personality, but if there was ever a president who might lose some people in his party if a wedge issue was taken away yeah. based on his personality, it is Donald Trump. So right. why is that precision argument not right, Michael? That that all he's not saying that it's going to animate or what's the opposite of animate, uh, deanimate the 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 public. He's talking about enough. It, it will matter to enough voters in the right states. Why is that wrong? So let me give you two explanations. One is I want to contest uh, Eric's anecdotal account of the importance of. Uh, the Supreme Court to abortion. I don't disagree that people care passionately about abortion. I do disagree somewhat that it's mostly about the Supreme Court. So uh, Lucinda Finley, who's a law professor at the University of Buffalo, wrote a chapter for a book I edit called Constitutional Law Stories on the backstory of Roe v. Wade. And what she tells is a story in which the, the deep opposition to legal abortion precedes Roe v. Wade. There's a conventional story that liberals tell themselves that, oh, uh, we were about to reach a compromise, everything was going to work out nicely, and then the Supreme Court <laughs> took the issue away from the people. Mm -hmm. What Finley finds, based on actual data, not talking to one of her friends who didn't show up at her wedding, uh, is that the, um, <laughs> the, the, there was, people were Cousins. being mo motivated uh, they were voting on the issue, there was organizing, and it's about a certain cultural understanding, and it's not primarily about the Supreme Court. Yes, it's been channeled into politics around the Supreme Court, but not, not exclusively about that. So I want to question the premise. Mike, before you make your second point. Let me have my second point, right? Uh, and, and the second point is that I don't disagree with Eric that you can find particular issues that are going to push one over the edge um, in any in a close election, uh, the question is: Is this the right one? Right there, are, there are probably other issues where you could find that. You know, if the Democratic Party changed its view about the about transgender rights, that would get you twelve additional voters in Michigan, or Michigan reparations, or how you get yeah universal health care or something right. that would get you. Hold, yeah, no, hold on a minute. First of all, in Supreme Myths, I cite Lucinda Finley all over my chapter on abortion. So I mean, I think she's a great scholar and all that. Mike, I don't understand why what happened in 1960 matters to this issue. The history of this is in 1973, row 73, seven to two. Seven to two, not five, four, seven to two. In 75 and 76, there is no big deal about it. In fact, Jerry Falwell, I believe in the mid seventies was asked about abortion. He thought, I don't care, who, who cares? What happened was Ronald Reagan, Ed Meese um, combined well, it was, it was really Ed Meeks, who had the evangelical connection, in the late 70s, made abortion the issue for the Republican Party, combined with, quote, an activist Supreme Court. And Lucinda's story is perfect prior to that point. But at that, at, at that point in time, everything changes. 
and Reagan calls it um, a holocaust, right? He calls abortion a holocaust while he is saying the Supreme Court is destroying our country. It is those two things. Well, that is that this history. Is, a, this is, a, yeah. is that wrong? Is there is there anything wrong with that history? Yeah, it's a monocausal theory of history, right? Ronald Reagan ran for president calling the Soviet Union an evil empire. He, he attacked welfare queens. He made, it, made coded statements about race. Uh, he, he said government is the problem, right? It was the whole range of issues. Abortion is, is a piece of it. But this idea that it is the be-all and end-all of politics is just a flattening of what's been going on for this. No, no, that's fair. No, my, my, my point there was Reagan didn't just talk about, no, that, I missed the point, Mike. I agree. Well, I'm not hearing Siegel now, defend you, Siegel. I'm not hearing Siegel say it's the be-all, end-all. And when you just listed those, Michael, what I heard was, okay, yep, so he's, he's shoring up the base on racism. He's shoring up the base on economics. He's shoring up the base. But he also was shoring up what I'm hearing from Siegel the base evangelicals on this issue of abortion, which- No, what, no, not oh. just abortion. That misses the point. We have the Federalist Society. We have Ed Meeks mm -hmm. because of the connection between the Supreme Court and abortion. If Roe never happens, and this comes about through legislation, and there's a fight, and there's a fight, and you know, 20 states say it's legal, and that's a whole different way Reagan would have presented this. It was presented as unelected life tenure judges using judicial activism to kill fetuses. Professor it Dorf? It was a two-pronged thing. Yeah. So um, long before that happened, there were signs throughout the South saying impeach Earl Warren, right? The Warren court didn't decide Roe. That was based on the uh, Brown against Board of Education and what's sometimes called the rights revolution of criminal suspects. Uh, so the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court, so it was an issue for the right then, um, and it would have continued to be even without Roe because there was enough other stuff to get people activated, especially race. I think that, you know, the, how, however important abortion is, and I think it's important in our, in our politics, uh, you know, race is the original sin of American constitutional democracy and continues to be a huge motivator for people. And again, right, politics is dynamic. So you, you take out abortion, it's not the case that everything else remains the same. Uh, you, you'll get a, a sort of uh, very uh, motivated politicians will use other wedge issues, and they've got plenty of them to, to drive things. So, you know, again, it, it, I'm not saying that what Eric's describing is impossible. It's possible. It's just I want to say that there's so much else going on that it seems to me pretty, you know, bold to hope you lose something in the hope that you then win as a result of losing. Well, when Mike, so when, Pete, when Mike says it's lose something, when, when Mike says lose something, that's a really important point we need to talk about. I think about abortion generally leaving you inside this specific issue. What do we lose if the court, I think Mike agrees that Justice Roberts is not just going to reverse the Louisiana law and say, we were right the first time, and Casey is right, and go on doing your business the same. That could happen, but it's extremely unlikely. So, right, Mike? I think there are any number of possibilities. They could, they could reverse and say, uh, you know, you got to follow Whole Woman's Health, the Texas case. They could affirm and say Louisiana is different from Texas. They could affirm and say the Texas case was wrong, but we're not reversing Casey and Roe, or they could reverse the whole thing. What's the light? I think the likeliest scenario is they make the undue burden test, which is clearly the law of the land, um, much more diluted after this June. That's the most likely scenario. Right, I don't know what the hell you just said. So, I said, I don't know what you just said. Let me tell you. So the law on abortion today is states can regulate abortion, but they can't put an undue burden in the way of women seeking abortion. Which is what the Louisiana case does. Yeah. Um, and in just four years ago, Justice Kennedy, kind of surprisingly, Mike can speak to that more than I can, but I think kind of surprisingly, uh, joined Justice Breyer's opinion, which made the undue burden test a real thing. Like, it, it was hard for states to get around that. Yeah. Now Louisiana is trying to do the same thing Texas did. And I think if you had to bet your life on it, you would bet that they're going to uphold the Louisiana law and make the undue burden test easier for states to meet. So, so let me... There's a lot more to this, and I'll let you make final points if you want, if you feel like you haven't. I want everybody to go read both these pieces at Dorf on Law. 
dot org, uh, Siegel's, and of course Michael Dorfman's, because it's it's it is such an important issue, obviously. And we're talking about uh, uh, we're talking about this upcoming election, and we're talking about what animates voters. And for a lot of reasons, it's really important. But since I have you both here, I, I really do want to talk just a little bit more, if we can, about the other cases that the Supreme Court is deciding on. Are there any other closing points on this issue in, uh, of abortion and how it does or does not animate voters? Well, I'm happy to leave it there. It's drive okay. people to my blog for follow-up. There you go. There you go. Drive to the blog. Okay. So we can't, we don't have time for all of them, um, every case, but there are big decisions coming down from the court potentially. I guess they can always punt, uh, but on guns, on Trump's taxes. What, what are the um, six cases? And then I'll, I'm going to pick like it's a game show, which ones that we discuss. And both of you guys are so good at this off the cuff. So Siegel, what are the, what are the six issues? Well, uh, uh, can, can I, 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 the case I'm most worried about is a Montana religion case. And we don't have to go into all the specific facts, but the Supreme Court might hold this term that if a state decides to give money to private non-religious schools, you know, just because we want kids to be smarter, they have to give money indirectly to um, private religious schools. In other words, it puts states to the choice. Okay. If you, if you want to help children in poor in, in private schools, you got to help children. In so that's schools. a religion case. And I'm worried about it. Okay. Lot. Next. Okay. That's one big case. Mike, go ahead. Uh, so I would put the uh, Trump financial records cases, and it's, there are actually two of them. Uh, I mean, it's, it's technically more than two, but there are really two, two main cases. Um, one involves the ability of Congress to subpoena uh, the president's uh, financial records. And another one involves a, a New York grand jury, uh, or in this case, the New York uh, official, but the case relates ultimately to grand jury subpoena power, the power of uh, state officials to get at the president's financial records. And uh, the, the, to my mind, the more important case, cases involve the congressional committees, uh, because I think there's at least a decent federalism argument that states oughtn't to be trying to supervise the president because uh, for obvious but reasons. But, but the, the, that case tees up a very important question about uh, the ability of Congress to oversee the, the presidency. And I think Mike and I agree. I, I wrote a piece on this for the Harvard Law Review blog. Um, the Congress should be able to get the president's tax returns um, in this situation. And not because it's Trump, not because of how I want the action to come out, because I think Congress needs to have that power. I think Mike agrees. I mean, how could, how, how could the public decide how they feel if there's no oversight about what your financial interests are in general? Mike? Like if I don't know where your money's tied up, um, then I don't I don't have the full picture of whether or not I should vote for you for mayor. Oh, yeah, exactly. And the you know it implicates all sorts of other questions like you know is the president using the uh, powers of his office for personal uh, financial gain? Um, the yeah. you know it's it certainly is relevant to impeachment and the the position that the Trump uh, people have taken uh, basically leaves Congress with no ability whatsoever to supervise the, the executive branch. Yeah. Even if he shot somebody on Fifth Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we've got the, uh, the, the Montana religious school case. You've got Trump's taxes. There's a guns case, isn't there, Professor Dorf? Yeah. So um, the gun case is, uh, comes out of New York City, which uh, had a law that made it essentially impossible to have a gun. Uh, and then they loosened it a little bit uh, so that you can now, um, you can transport it uh, in certain ways to like a, a shooting range. Uh, but the fundamental question that the case seems to present is whether the right to keep and bear arms, which the court said in a couple of cases in 2008 and 2010, whether that includes only a right to armed self-defense in your home or whether you can go about in public carrying a gun. Uh, and obviously that implicates public safety because in many cities, right, there are laws about uh, carrying guns in public, either concealed or openly. Uh, the, there's a threshold question in the case as to whether it's moot, given that the city repealed the law that was at issue and replaced it with a different one, but it looks like the justices are determined to reach the question. He, All right. uh, one thing about that case, just yeah. in non-legal terms, the idea that New York City would be prohibited by the Constitution 
from saying no guns in Times Square. We just don't want guns in Times Square. Or we don't want, you know, we, or, or, or San Francisco saying we don't want guns in Fisherman's Wharf. It's so obscene <laughs> and so absurd that it's barely tolerable to even utter that sentence. You agree with that, Michael? Sorry, I have to unmute my microphone because my dog was barking a moment ago. Um, well, we, wel we welcome that here on the okay, show. So you can, you, as you were, Bill. Um, the, uh, the dog is led into the New York Public Library. <laughs> right. well, he's, uh, he's masquerading as a service dog. Um, <laughs> you fraud, you. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I agree with that. I okay. mean, you know, it's, it's an irony, right, that the justices who are most adamant and in favor of gun rights also purport to care about federalism. And you would think that this is an area where you allow states and localities to chart their own course. All right, so guns, religious schools getting funding, Trump's taxes, and of course we spent most of this time talking about abortion, so that's four. Uh, Siegel, what's the next of the six? There's a case that I haven't studied, maybe Mike has, so I'll, I'll defer to him if he has. The faithless elector case seems to be a very important case. Mike, you wanna take that one? Because I have not. Yeah, yeah. Sure, so, um, the Electoral College, as we know, is this horrible artifact of the founding of the Constitution. <laughs> um, the, the, the question that posed is whether uh, a state can uh, basically remove an elector who casts a ballot for somebody other than the person they were chosen for. So in the particular case, this was an elector from Colorado who was uh, chosen for uh, the Democratic Party slate. He didn't like Hillary Clinton, and so he cast his ballot for John Kasich, of, of all things. Uh, and then the, uh, the, the state removed him and said, no, you can't cast that ballot. And so someone else they cast him instead uh, for, different, for, for Clinton. Uh, and the question was whether he, as an elector, had a constitutional right to vote in the same way that you or I might have a constitutional right to vote for a candidate we choose. Now, the great irony here is that you and I don't have a constitutional right to vote, uh, be, at least in presidential elections. Our right to vote in a presidential election is determined by uh, Article Two of the uh, Constitution and the 12th Amendment, which collectively leave it up to the state legislature to define whether or what, what rights we have. So the, the case is not that important for this particular issue, it's potentially extremely important, I think, for the coming election, because depending on the course of the pandemic, um, you know, you could see something like what happened in Wisconsin a few weeks ago, leading one state or another to decide, you know what, we're not going to have a, 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 an election. We're not going to have it. The ah, 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 wow, wow, wow. Holy cow, that last point. Yeah. I mean, I was not so interested in this when Siegel explained it to me. <laughs> I saw uh, you before. fall asleep. Well, um, well, when, hey. you know, when you use the Wisconsin point, I mean, I just, I didn't know about that, the constitutional rights to vote. I had never, I'm glad you explained it. All right. And I just hey, realized, one more case. One yeah. more case. well, I realized, by the way, that I've been saying there's these six cases, but there's a bunch of cases. These are six that you've highlighted to me. So maybe well, there's, there's a, one more constitutional yeah. case that the yeah. facts were too kind of dull to go, go into, but get into the question. When can Congress limit the president's ability to fire um, the heads of agencies? And this separation of powers case, which is very dry, has enormous implications for the separation of powers. And um, the president wants to have... You can't sex it up? No, I don't think so. Maybe. Or maybe Michael can. He well, seems I mean, to the, be idea, able to... the idea is, can Congress limit the president's ability to fire the heads of independent agencies? Why isn't that interesting to me? That's interesting. That's sexy. Can and, the well, well, the sexy part of it is it goes to the whole unitary executive idea. Oh, now you're losing people, it. Yeah. yeah, that people probably heard about. And um, it goes to really, you know, can Congress have independent agency? That's where we're heading on this. Can Congress yeah. have independent Create agency? independent agency. Create independent agency. Yeah, and so think, think about the Federal Election Commission, the federal <laughs> what is he what breed Sorry. is that that's fine what breed uh so i've got I've, i have three dogs here i'll, I'll turn off the virtual background so you can actually oh! see that. Uh, <laughs> it'll ruin everything what are well, we about it'd be hilarious oh hey. my gosh it was gonna be hilarious if you turned off your virtual background and it was yes. actually something even more elaborate look at that pup <laughs> that's chewy that's blue in the background there hey blue can I come in and say hello i i would show my dogs but they're on twitter all the time so i don't know oh, that's true you got yours as well the third one is a husky um oh, all right wow so, beauties uh you know the these federal agencies are it's very important that they have some degree of independence uh because 
they serve functions that we want politically insulated. So just take the Federal Reserve, right? The uh, Trump is constantly uh, threatening to fire the head of the Federal Reserve, uh, Jerome Powell, uh, even though he appointed him, uh, because Powell well, is actually- That's not an exception to the rule, that is the rule. Right, right, that's right. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Powell is actually doing his job of trying to navigate a sound course between, you know, inflation and unemployment, and especially now that means, uh, you know, pumping the economy f full of money. Um, and it's important that the, the uh, Federal Reserve be independent of politics, because we know that otherwise what presidents are tempted to do is right before an election campaign, they flood the economy with cheap money, which is good in the short term, but it's a sugar high, uh, and then it typically leads to a downturn. And you can do that in reverse as well. So, but that's just one agency. There are lots of agencies where it's important to have uh, experts who are somewhat insulated from politics, uh, but you know, there's this movement on the right, which Eric uh, co correctly calls this unitary executive, that says that, no, you can't have any of that because the Constitution has an Article One, an Article Two, and Article Three. One is Congress, three is the courts, two is the president. There's nothing in between one and two. No, there's no Article One and a half for a branch that's sort of not directly supervised by the president. Uh, and so they want everybody to have to answer directly to the president, which is very dangerous, even when you have a normal president. It's especially yeah. dangerous now. All right, so final question, gentlemen, final question, which is very relevant to what is happening right now. There's a huge constitutional question about the power of the federal government versus the states on any number of issues. But the president of the United States last week says, I have total complete authority, which every single legal scholar said the guy has no idea what he's talking about, even those who generally support him. That being said, now you've got the attorney general giving him cover in terms of this whole reopen the government thing. So the question for both of you is, who has the power to tell states that they can or cannot close or they can or cannot open? And what does Attorney General Barr's recent, what, paper, memo? No, he was, on, he, was on, he was on Hugh Hewitt's show, Pete. Oh, how great. I've been on Hugh Hewitt's show, too. It may have been Eric treat. Erickson's show. I think it was Hugh. I've been, I've been on Hugh Hewitt's show, too. Yeah, what a treat. Anyway, yeah. um, what, Michael Dorff, Professor Dorff, what is, what is the constitutional interpretation of the, the power of states over the federal government when it comes to opening and closing something America is not used to closing, okay, like any other country is? Uh, so, you know, Trump is wrong, but he's not wrong in the way that most people say, right? That is, so, you know, um, the, uh, my governor, uh, Andrew Cuomo, said that Trump doesn't understand principles of federalism. It's true that Trump doesn't understand principles of federalism, but that wasn't the problem. Congress could, in my view, open or close the economy throughout the country. And if it did so, it would preempt, that is to say, displace any contrary state law. Hmm. Congress could even delegate to the president the power to open or close the economy. Right? So the problem isn't that the federal government lacks the power over the states here. The federal government does have the, that power, subject to concerns around the edges about the scope of the power to regulate interstate commerce. Uh, but the president doesn't have that power unilaterally. There's no statute that authorizes him to override the governors. The here. federal government has the ability to, to do a lot of this, but the it's the legislative Correct. branch, not Correct. the executive branch. Right. Hold on. Now, Mike and I agree on this 100%, and actually we agree on many things. But here's the irony about this that just makes me want to kill myself. Oh, The dear. Republican part, not kill myself, but it makes me very upset. The president presumably is a Republican and a member of the Republican Party. And it is the Republican Party who destroyed Obama to some significant degree, impaired Obamacare because of arguments that the federal government didn't have powers like this. And the idea that now the Republican Party would stand behind somebody who would say, frankly, either the president or Congress could do it. I mean, Mike and I agree constitutionally they could do it. If you ask Randy Barnett, I'd love to hear what he would say because Randy spent most of his, you know, decade of the, of the early 2000s arguing for the limited power well, of the federal government. situational ethics. No, no, Randy, Randy, says, Randy says the government can't do it. I debated him recently. It's online somewhere on like The Hill or something, some magazine like that. Right. Uh, so he, he's consistent. But you're right that the Republican Party has fallen into line behind Trump on this. And that just shows, again, the point I was making earlier, that our, our politics are tribal. It's not about having a consistent position. It's about supporting your team.
Well, hold, on. Right. So, hold on. But Rand, so Randy said the government could not do it. Right. right. That, that's what I expected him to say. Good for him. I mean, he's that's good, good for him. Um, but the Republican, I'm talking about politics now, there were, which obviously is situational and, and all that. But the idea that the Republican Party would take the position the federal government could require the states to open or close is inconsistent with everything they said from 2010 to 2016. Let me try to push back on one thing, Michael, in general, when people say this, and I, I don't know why it's resonated when you say it, but when you say our politics are tribal, isn't that, a, 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 is it a false equivalency in that, in that we're partisan in many ways and tribal in many ways, but, but Trump is more like a cult leader. And it's more like, I don't think, like the, the fight between progressive liberal Democrats, whatever you want to call them, over the progressive wing and the quote moderate wing is real. And it's based on policies, generally speaking. And, and so is, are they all tribal or is it more Trump doctrine? Not even because it's not conservative or, or Republican doctrine. It's just what he says goes. Yeah. So, yes. Right. I, by saying politics are tribal, I don't mean to deny that there are actual policy disputes and that they have important political consequences. But long before Trump, you saw this phenomenon. Right. Think about the following question. Why is it that people who are generally uh, pro-life on abortion also favor robust Second Amendment rights? Mm. Right. The two things have nothing right. to do with each other. Right. Uh, and yet, and you can you can go down the list and find these correlations. And it's because the identity comes first, and then the issue alignments uh, go along with them. Um, Eric Posner, the point. son of Pete, Eric Posner, the son of retired Judge Richard Posner, um, wrote a book on American dem. Uh, Demagogue. Um, demagogue. Uh, Demagoguery? Uh, what was Huey Long, Mike? I'm, I'm having a brain. Who's a demagogue? Demagogue, right. Eric wrote a book on demagogues. And when we're talking about people like Huey Long and Trump, um, and there are a few others, I think you're right, Pete. I think the normal ru rules don't, don't come into play. And we have a much more cult-like system of politics where he, he could say anything. I don't, I don't think it, Jimmy Carter or George Bush could have said anything and his followers would have gone, well, that's, that's fine. I think Trump can say anything. I'll shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and my followers would still support me. Well, he, he, he drank life. chlorine or whatever yeah. the hell he calls it. I mean, like, <laughs> or, or don't, you know, whatever it is. These are life and death. He's telling people in there, not all of them, but a lot of them are listening. Don't get I mean, vaccinated. We, what I've, Don't been get vaccinated. About, what I've been tweeting a lot about recently is the Fellow Society, which began in the early 80s, st used to stand for basically three principles. The Federalist Society, yeah. yeah well, it's huge because Trump is aligned with the Federalist Society, yeah. and the executive vice president was in the White House picking his judges. This is such an irony. The Federalist Society began committed to limited judicial review. That's out the window. That's not a Trump thing. But also separation of powers and federalism. Like, that's what they claim to be all about. And Trump is eviscerating, and Barr is eviscerating separation of powers and federalism across the board. And yet, it seems like the federal society's leadership is still supporting him. And that's just, I don't know what to do with that. Well, a lot Mike, to be said. Mike, do you disagree with that, any of that? No, I don't, I don't disagree. I mean, the, you know, the, there used to be this, a uh, strong divide within the Republican coalition between sort of the Wall Street wing and the social conservative wing. And what you've described as the Federal Society position was a kind of a bridge, right? It's limited government and, you know, limited judiciary. Each gives gets what, what they want. Uh, I think what's happened, and, and you saw this in the amazing response to Barr's speech at the Federal Society, which was sort of down the line, social conservative nationalist, not what we think of as sort of the libertarian wing of the Republican Party, but he got a tremendous response. I think what you've seen is a kind of realignment so that one almost doesn't even notice the difference between these wings. Yes, there are, there are never Trump Republicans, uh, but they get, you know, they, they get sort of shunted out of the, the party entirely so that, you know, it, it has become, as you said, Pete, almost a, a cult of personality. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, uh, which is something. Wait, wait, is the worst person ever to have that, to <laughs> lead that cult. It's a real problem. Well, usually they, they're pretty bad people. Yeah. I'm watching that David Koresh thing on Netflix. I'm, I'm obsessed with it. It's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, everybody has to be celibate at the, uh, at the place, but him. <laughs>
I mean, that's right. how do you convince people? Well, Married I mean, men. Pete, I mean, Trump saying my followers would follow me if I shot somebody on Fifth Avenue is not that different. It's, <laughs> it's, well, it's, it, the, the exact equivalent would be Trump going, listen, I'm going to fuck your wife and you're going to have to be okay with it. <laughs> And and people be like, all right. I mean, it's it. it I don't. I, I I can't imagine. All right, that was pretty extreme. Now my all kids right. can't watch this. Thanks a lot, Pete. I appreciate I'm sorry, it. man. Um, and now um, I hopefully I was gonna say hopefully we can uh, we can post this on the blog too. Uh, maybe I don't know if you can accommodate video, but but gentlemen, I really appreciate an hour of your time joining me. What a fascinating discussion to have both of your voices. I highly recommend folks go to Dwarf on Law favorite it on your favorite internet browser and read what these gentlemen, these guys are writing and everybody else is writing on that blog as well. And uh, what else uh, do I need to plug here? Professor Dorf, Cornell University, thank you very much. Anything else I, I need to plug? Uh, that does it for me. Thanks so much. It was fun to be here. Uh, Siegel, you good? I'm good, Pete, except for the Daisy Alex thing, which I think you did on purpose. Too. Now, I have no idea who this person is that it says you're, you are on, but it's got to be on your end. And Thanks, I, Mike. I, I highly Thanks. recommend Thanks, you ask Daisy. the kids. Thanks, <laughs> Daisy. All right, guys. Take Talk care. to you soon. Thank Bye -bye. you.